Hi guys and welcome to Art History Arts 1303. Um, I'm your instructor George Neal, in case you don't remember, and today we are going to start um, the lecture portion of the course. I do want to remind you uh, how important it is to take notes during this part of the course uh, because there are going to be weekly quizzes and weekly summaries. Uh, these are, in, are, in, in, are going to include terminology and concepts covered in, this, in, in these lectures and in your book. So it's really important that you take notes as you go along. I do want to remind you that I will make PDFs available of all of the slides that I cover in each lecture. These will be located right below um, in, in this lecture in the module. So if you want to download and print those PDFs, you can. But not every term or every important concept I cover will be written down on these slides. So that's why it's important for you to write these down. All right, so let's get going. Uh, today we are going to be looking at a period called the Paleolithic period. The Paleolithic is a period that lasts uh, a very long time, but it really ends around, around 10,000 BC or so. But in this period, we are looking at prehistory. And prehistory, of course, means that nothing is written down yet because there are no written languages. Everything is uh, communicated orally. So uh, there is no history. Uh, but to say there, there, uh, this doesn't mean there aren't artifacts. And, uh, and especially for us, uh, an art history class, there are quite a number of artifacts in the form of images that we are going to be studying. So even before we were making uh, written language, we were recording our human experiences uh, through images, and that's what we're going to be looking at primarily uh, today. Okay, um, so before we get deep into the Paleolithic, let's look at something really, really old, older than the Paleolithic. Uh, this is something that, this is um, not even something we could call art. This is a pebble that has worn down uh, to, due to some sort of erosion. And this was found among um, some other artifacts related to early, early human beings. This in itself was not something that was actually manufactured. And that's what makes art art, right? Is that it is designed or created or made. Uh, but this was found. But as many of you have probably done before, uh, you know, you, we often see recognizable shapes and patterns in uh, random places. And that's kind of what's going on here. One of our ancient, ancient, ancient ancestors found this pebble, thought it looked like a human face, and uh, sort of kept it. Uh, whether this had some sort of spiritual or other kinds of uh, significance or import is debatable and ultimately unknown. But certainly the connection that this early ancestor of ours had uh, with this object and with the uh, idea that there is a human face um, resembled in this object is important because it's our first evidence that human beings can see images in things, right? Um, we can't make our own images yet. We haven't figured out how to do that, but we now have the ability to see images, even if they're random images, in, well, random objects like this pebble. But we don't really see art, um, objects that are made uh, until around about 40,000 BC. And this can include anything from like jewelry made of seashells uh, to decorations on weapons and tools or images and sculptures. And it is around 40,000 that we start to see the earliest examples of these. Let's think about what this means for a minute, guys. So. With the invention of art, with the invention of images, uh, we now have a way of recording the world as we see it and capturing things permanently so we can go back and look at them later. This is the first time this ever happened. And it's a huge cognitive leap. I mean, think about it. Somebody had to invent the concepts of pictures or sculptures that you can observe something and then you can manipulate charcoal or chalk or clay 
or whatever materials were available and recreate something that you see. That had to be invented. And that's an incredible, not only is it an incredible cognitive leap, but it also means now that we have power over our world in a way we didn't beforehand. Uh, instead of just telling somebody uh, about something, we can now show them um, an event or a thing or a person or an animal we encountered and that other person doesn't have to be there. It's a whole new way of transferring information. And it makes us, it's one of the things that makes humans humans, guys. I mean, yeah, we can train some other species of animals to make art, but no other animal but us, on their own free will, figure it out that you can represent the world that you see in the form of an image. It's a big deal. <laughs> and and that's why that's why art's important. You know, that's because it's 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 older than writing, right? It is one of the things that sets us apart from all other creatures on the planet. So I'm going to go back to the map for a second. Um, so this is uh, what we're going to be, this is the area we're going to be primarily focusing on in this lecture, um, prehistoric Europe. And we're going to be in a period called the Paleolithic. Paleo literally means old, lithic means stone. So we are in the Old Stone Age. And this is an incredibly long period in human history, uh, but we're really going to be looking at the last few 10,000 years of the Paleolithic era. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at um, uh, specifically uh, the art of Paleolithic Europe. So to give you an idea of what was life, li life was like at this point, um, we need to understand that we are looking at an ice age. And so, you know, a, a big chunk of, uh, of Earth was covered in a permanent or semi-permanent winter uh, at this point in history. Uh, our ancient ancestors living in Europe uh, were hunters and gatherers. They were nomadic. They tended not to stay settled in one place for too long because they depended on the movement of food to survive, not just following herds of animals that they hunted around, but also cultivating wild um, fruits and vegetables. Uh, and there's now that there's even evidence of, of, wild, of wild grains, really whatever we could find. So we had to go where the food is, so we had to travel and be mobile. Um, so there are no really permanent dwellings at this time uh, in our lives. Also, um, it's important to remember that human life would have been incredibly difficult. Uh, human lifespans were short. Most people didn't make it past their early 20s. Uh, the infant mortality rate, meaning the rate at which well, infants survive or don't survive was incredibly high. Uh, babies very, very were unlikely to grow up to be adults, so it was a very difficult life. And yet, at this point in our history, where we are as likely to be prey as we are to be predator, at this point in our history where we're nomadic and spend a lot of our time looking for food, we started to make art. We started to make what we call representational images. What does that mean? What is a representational image? A representational image is an image that is meant to resemble or represent a real life person, place, or thing. So any picture of, you know, here's your textbook. The cover of this is a representational image. This is a picture of a person. But in the same way that a, an emoji smiley face is a representational image because that is meant to represent, even though in a very abstract, cartoonish way, a human face. Those are both representational images. It doesn't have to, representational doesn't deal with how realistic something looks like. Um, it just deals with the, the fact that it represents something real in the real world uh, at all, okay? So, uh, we started making representational images. Um, and so what kinds of stuff did we start making? Well, some of the earliest objects that we have found related to Paleolithic people, uh, people of the old Stone Age, because they used stone tools, uh, were statues. 
Uh, the image on the right is a sort of rare and weird kind of statue. Uh, first of all, this is an image of a male, and mostly, most of the artifacts that we have found in terms of sculpture have been um, female. Also, this is a weird hybrid creature. This is not just a man, but it is a man with the head of possibly a lion or some other sort of, of feline. So what was this used for? Uh, we don't know, right? <laughs> uh, we don't have any historical evidence because there is no writing yet. Um, this probably had some sort of ritualistic purpose. It was probably used uh, in relation maybe to some sort of spiritual or religious belief. But beyond that, we don't know. Um, but we do know that it was important enough that it was it was created. You'll also notice its size. It's about a foot tall. And this is actually rather large for most Paleolithic sculpture, especially um, sculpture that was meant to be portable. Um, Paleolithic sculpture in general is small um, because human beings were nomadic and it had to be small. This is on the larger end of of typical sizes. On the left, we have an image um, that your book just labels Nude Woman, but it, which is popularly known as the Venus of Willendorf, or sometimes called the Woman of Willendorf. Um, Venus, of course, is the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Well, you know, the Romans, uh, look at the date on this thing. This, this object is anywhere between 28 to 25,000 BCE. That's incredibly old, and that's, you know, 25,000 years before the Romans, who invented the goddess Venus, existed. So you don't hear the term Venus of Willendorf all that much anymore, um, because it, it basically, it's assuming a lot. It's assuming that this is an image of a goddess. It's assuming that this is a goddess of love. We don't know any of that. So. The best thing is just to call her Nude Woman or the Woman of Willendorf. But she's incredibly important because when she was discovered in the early 20th century um, in Austria, in Europe, along uh, uh, the banks of the Danube River, she was the oldest sculpture at that point ever found. And she, in many ways, represents uh, something that's very common in Paleolithic sculpture. It's an image of a woman, it's an image of a nude woman, and it's an image that emphasizes the um, parts of her anatomy, her physiology, that relate exclusively to childbirth or child rearing. So we can see that she has this large belly, breast, and her genitals are prominent. Um, this tells us, you know, that uh, she was probably some sort of fertility figure, but how she was used, we don't know. We also know that um, other parts of her body that don't relate to fertility are either, um, well, you know, almost they're not there at all, like her feet, or they're greatly reduced, like her thin little arms here, or they're, you know, like, like her feet, they're completely absent, like her face. Um, there's lots of theories about why. Um, one theory is that since this is a fertility figure, um, the parts of her body dealing with a reproduction are exaggerated and the parts that don't deal with that are almost ignored or reduced. Uh, the other, there's another theory that this was created by a woman looking downwards. And so she doesn't have a face and she doesn't have feet because that's not what she sees. Now, ultimately, I don't know. None of us truly know. Um, but we can take a fairly educated guess that this is a, some sort of fertility figure. Now, um, how was it used? Once again, we don't know. It, there, it could have been maybe used, you know, when mom and dad cavemen go to bed at night and kept under the pillow to maybe ensure fertility, or maybe it was used as a... Uh, and some sort of ritual regarding fertility. Once again, we don't know. What we do know is that this, or what we can take a good guess about is this is what is called a fetish. Now, let's not use, that's a word that has a very different meaning when it's used commonly today. Um, fetish, of course, means some sort of source of, of sort of sexual focus, right? Usually an object. Um, 
or an act. But in, in this case, when we use the term fetish, we're using the anthropological term that means an object that is meant to have some sort of special ability or power. Uh, think of like a good luck charm. If you have like a lucky coin or something like that, a lucky guitar pick, uh, whatever it is, then you know, that's a fetish. I wouldn't walk around telling people that because they'll give you weird looks uh, because of the, <laughs> the meaning of the word today, but this is, in the anthropological sense, probably a kind of fetish meant to ensure fertility. What we do know about this image, that is anywhere between 25,000 to 28,000 uh, from BC and its creation, is that it was not the only one. In fact, there are similar objects that were found all over Europe, as far away as modern-day Russia, all the way to parts of northern Africa and throughout Europe. And over a wide period of time, there are figures that are, as old, that are older than the woman of Willendorf. In fact, the woman of Hallefels in Germany is is thought to be a, a, created around 40,000 BC. And then there's other objects that were created as recently as like, you know, 12 or 13,000 BC. So um, these were made over literally tens of thousands of years in, in time. These were created over a large geographical area spanning, you know, parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa. And yet this image persists with the diminished features in the faces with the exaggerated breast bellies and genitals telling us that this figure, whatever it was, was important. But she was probably utilized through many different cultures who spoke many different languages and maybe practiced very different sorts of religious and spiritual practices. But this persists, doesn't it? Um, on the left is another image, but much larger than the ones we have seen. This is what is known as a relief sculpture. What is a relief sculpture? A relief sculpture is uh, a sculpture carved onto a surface uh, and either projects or is recessed into that flat surface. Uh, so <coughs> if you want to think about, well, the image on the left is a relief sculpture. It, it, this is projects from a surface. Think about a coin with its raised portrait of a, of a president's head on it. That is actually a, a form of what we call low relief or ba, B-A-S, relief, ba, relief. Um, this is an image of a woman with a horn. You'll notice that we have the same exaggerated features as we saw in the others, and uh, the big difference here is a horn. This was from a, a, a cave or outside of a cave in La Salle, France. And the, the, the horn itself is probably also a symbol of fertility, but instead of female fertility like we saw earlier, this is a symbol of male fertility. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to see that, image, that images of bulls uh, are often used as a symbol for male fertility and often male power in ancient art. And uh, part of this is because of the horns and the shape of the horns, uh, which strongly represent uh, are, are, uh, a phallus, uh, the male genitals, and kind of representing male power and fertility. And so this is, of course, uh, often interpreted as a fertility symbol. The image on the right I find to be rather fascinating because it is a slight variation of this fertility figure that we have been looking at. Uh, this is from, um, also from France. Uh, uh, but this woman has some small features. Uh, she also appears to be more slender than some of the other images we see. Um, but yet, at the same time, she's probably still one of these fertility figures. So, as I, as I said before, um, we were, our ancestors were nomadic. And the Paleolithic period, uh, we traveled around hunting and gathering. So even though we, we will see that the art was created in caves, cra caves weren't permanent dwellings. Um, in fact, most of the year we lived in a portable structures. These structures could be made from all sorts of things. Wood was probably very common, although we don't really have um, a lot of physical evidence to support that because wood rots. Uh, but also bones, especially bones of large animals like woolly mammoths, were often used to construct shelters as we see in uh, uh, this 
shelter uh, that was found in uh, in Ukraine. Um, it is made from mammoth bones, and it would have been covered with with skin. So this is really more kind of a typical of the sorts of shelters that are in the architecture that our early ancestors would have made. Um, let's look at some images of bulls, or bison in this case, which are related. Um, this, these are rather large sculptures. Uh, these are a whopping sort of two feet long, and these are made from clay that had been plastered on top of an outcropping of rocks in front of a cave. And they had been molded with hands to resemble bulls. Or bison. Sorry, biology majors out there. I don't want to upset anybody. Uh, and you can see that um, the bulls are shown in profile, which is very common for a lot of images at this time, because profiles show off a lot of the entire body, right? You can see the entire face, all of the legs of the animal. Um, it gives you an, a general idea of the overall size of the creature. So most images of animals would be shown in profile, sort of, you know, from the side at this point. Um, the other, another early relief sculpture is an image of a reclining woman. This is uh, from, also from France. A lot, of these, a lot of the earliest art has been found in France and Spain. Um, this is, once again, very similar to our fertility figure, although here we see her reclining. Um, is this a, sort of a, um, uh, an allusion to sexual activity? Um, perhaps. Uh, we're not really quite sure, but certainly she exhibits many of the same features uh, that we would have seen uh, in our portable uh, sculpture. Um, you'll notice once again, this is on the larger end. This is a whopping two feet, three inches or so. Um, this is from Africa. This is from a cave in Namibia. Uh, this comes around the, from a, the Paleolithic era. So we've been looking at primarily European art, but certainly there was art created in, in Africa, and that's where that little pebble that we saw earlier came from. And of course, Africa being the birthplace of humanity, um, we do find an awful lot of art there. Although um, the, the caves in Europe, the art tends to be, um, to be larger at this point in the Paleolithic. But here we have a rather small um, image from a cave called the Apollo 11 cave in Namibia. Uh, once again, we have an image of an animal. We're not really quite sure what kind of animal it is. It's probably a male animal, um, shown once again in, in profile. Uh, it is made with charcoal, which is a very common substance used in drawings uh, by our early Paleolithic ancestors. Another profile animal, this time a, 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 a low relief or ba, B-A-S, that's how you spell it, B-A-S relief sculpture. It's a French term. Um, ba relief is uh, an image of a bison. This was carved on a reindeer horn. This also comes from Madeline, from France, from Madeleine, France. Uh, it is an animal that is licking its its hindquarters. Um, so it's, it's this is actually a really uh, I think this is a fascinating image because the artist has taken the shape of the rock and really probably not done a lot to it um, except for carving this head on it. And he carved the head sort of turning in on itself. Uh, to conform to the shape of the rock. It's very clever, isn't it? Um, and then they have incised. Incised just means to cut lines into the image, image here. All right, so let's look at some cave art. Um, the first cave discovered in the modern era uh, of the, the first Paleolithic cave discovered in the moder modern era. It was found in Altamira, Spain. Altamira is um, a, a, a cave system that um, in, in contains a number of large drawings. These uh, were discovered sort of remarkably by accident. A, um, in 1879, a guy named Marcelino Sanz de Sotula Satuola, my apologies, and his daughter Maria were wandering around 
their property. Uh, the little girl sees a little hole in the ground, she sort of wiggles her way into it, and she finds herself in a cave, in a large chamber. She has her little lantern with her, she looks up at the ceiling and she sees flickering above her a series of images. Um, these are rather large images, these are five, uh, over five feet long, so they're, you know, about half life size and their scale. They were made with a combination of materials including charcoal and ochre, which is a natural mineral uh, pigment. Um, this ochre is usually earth tones, so reds, yellows, uh, those, those are very common colors produced. The, the bisons were, um, uh, appear to be lying on their side, perhaps dead. Um, when this was discovered, um, they went to, the, uh, Maria and her father went to their local sort of basically university and historical societies and said, hey, I think we found something pretty cool. We should really look into this. And everybody just kind of went, nah, this is nothing. There's, there's nothing here. Um, this is a hoax, uh, some of them even said. And it, it, it took a few decades. It took discoveries of several other caves around France and Spain, and it took the invention of a technique called carbon-14 dating to finally verify that, yes, these are extremely old um, images, and they are not a hoax. Carbon-14 is a technique for dating um, a specific what's called an isotope uh, that, uh, called carbon-14 that exists in organic material and it decays at a very specific rate. So we can get a pretty good idea how old something is by how much this carbon-14 isotope has decayed. Now the older the object, the harder it is to get exactly right. So an object, and I'm, I'm just sort of using numbers as examples here, but an object that's like a thousand years old, we could date probably within like, you know, one to five percent. An object that's 30,000 years old, it's going to be more like, you know, 10%. <laughs> so it doesn't, it gets less exact, but it still gets us in a general ballpark. But this is why you're going to see numbers like this. If you look in the right-hand corner in the description, you'll see that it says this was made 13 to 11,000 years ago. It's because we can't pinpoint exactly, but we can get within a, a fairly close estimation here. But after this, this Altamira was legitimized and the discovery was certified, uh, then all of a sudden um, more and more and more caves were discovered throughout Europe. And some of them uh, quite old, like this is Peshmeral. Uh, Peshmeral is interesting because um, it contains human uh, imagery, which is rare in these early cave paintings. Most early cave art is typically of animals, um, with a smaller percentage of the images being um, sort of abstract shapes like lines and circles and sort of geometric forms, and then a very small percentage being images of humans. Um, so this is fascinating because these handprints are not drawings of hands, but they're actual, basically stencils, if you think about it, of hands. What the, er what the early artists did here was they took ground pigments, charcoal, ochres, and they smeared animal fat on the wall of the cave. They placed their hand down, then they took a hollow reed, like a straw, filled it with the pigment, and blew on their hands, and it formed Aha! Uh -huh. A an, an an outline of their of their hands. Um, what does this mean? Is this some sort of signature? Maybe. Is this some way of uh, showing power over the animals, which maybe were hunted by these people? That's possible too. What do these spots mean? We don't know. There's still so much we don't know about these images, but we um, we do. Um, we can only take educated uh, guesses, really. Uh, Lascaux is one of the largest uh, cave systems. 
Um, this is called the Hall of Bulls. Uh, Lascaux is also one of the younger uh, caves, relatively. So these are, you know, from 16 to 14,000 BCE. Uh, so this is almost half the age of Peshmero, which we just saw. Uh, Lascaux is... Uh, uh, contains some very, very large images. Like the image of the bull over here on the right is an 11 foot drawing. So, you know, if a person were standing, on, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, these, this is pretty much like a life size image of a bull. I mean, this is almost the size of, of a small car, right? This is a huge drawing, and the other drawings are, are also comparably large. You'll notice that they're also on the ceiling. Um, Lasco, is, um, in many places, the images overlap, and there's, a, and there's a good chance that these images weren't all made at the same time, but instead made over a series of thousands of years, perhaps, with subsequent generations coming in and adding images onto them. You'll also notice that the images are on the ceiling, and in most cases, images tend to be elevated, either high on a wall or on the ceiling of a cave. Um, which, uh, which a lot of archaeologists uh, interpret to mean that these have spiritual meaning because high places are holy places, and so maybe these animals represent some sort of spiritual power. Um, we're not exactly sure, but that's, that's certainly a guess that these do represent some sort of spiritual power. Um, these are also located deep within a cave. So, it, you know, it would have been pitch black in here. Um, many of the play areas of Lascaux are very difficult to access. You have to crawl through areas that are, you know, you know, just a few feet wide and squeeze your body in to get to these chambers. And so this, these were reached with great difficulty. Also, um, when they were created, that meant that torches had to be brought in and set up and fires burned while these were created. Also, things like scaffolding had to be built to create these. So these aren't, these weren't done out of boredom, out of boredom, right? It's not like Og the caveman was looking for something to do one day and decided to draw a picture. These were made with an express purpose. What exactly that purpose is, we don't know. Uh, but it probably involved some sort of spiritual meaning um, at some point. But Lasco is huge. It contains something over like 600 images. Um, it was also discovered sort of at random. A, a group of teenagers stumbled across it. Basically, a guy was walking his dog named Robot. And Robot, being a bad boy, fell in a hole. And so this guy came back with his friends to rescue Robot the dog and made a, a tremendous discovery of Lasco. But Lasco is filled with different kinds of animals, bison, reindeer, uh, various kinds of large felines, um, lions, um, just sort of this kind of sort of uh, um, hodgepodge of, of different animals that go deep, deep, deep into this cave system, you know, almost a mile deep uh, in areas. Um, I think one of the most fascinating images from Lasco is is this image that's often referred to as a Chinese horse because it kind of looks like art from ancient China. Although, once again, keep in mind, we are 10,000 years away from China even being a thing. So, um, these names often are misleading, like the Venus or Chinese, because Venus and China weren't invented yet. Um, above the horse, you will see some a, a what we call a glyph, basically just a, a drawing, an abstract sort of shape of lines and, and, and geometric squares. What it means, we don't know. Um, it, it probably has some sort of significance. Is it uh, a symbol for this horse? Perhaps it has four legs or four glyphs coming out of, out of it. It's possible, but ultimately we don't know. You can see an image of, of arrows uh, being thrown at it, so this is possibly uh, an animal that was hunted. But not all of the animals at Lasco and these other caves were hunted. Uh, some of them weren't hunted at all because the kinds of weapons we had at the time um, 
weren't good enough to hunt certain kinds of animals, very powerful animals. We hunt, tended to hunt really big, slow things or really small things. Um, and you don't, you never see like small animals in these caves. You'll never see like bunny rabbits or squirrels uh, or insects, even those, even though those were certainly images of, uh, those were certainly animals that we consumed and ate. Um, but um, all, not all of the images on these caves were necessarily food source animals, although some of them were, but they are all powerful animals, which is another reason why we often think that these have some sort of spiritual meaning. They represent some sort of primal forces, um, whatever that may be, but they, they represent power. Um, this is also from Lascaux. This is a rare image of a human being. And like our uh, figure that we saw earlier, our sculpture, this is a hybrid creature. But instead of the head of, an, of a cat, uh, feline, we're seeing a head of a bird. This is obviously a male figure, so we could also maybe be uh, dealing with the concept of fertility here. We see an image of a bison uh, um, over here and a rhino on the other side, two powerful animals who have horns. Um, once again, there's the concept here of male fertility. We see you know, the male genitals being um, kind of highlighted here, and then this concept of this bull. Um, if you look closely at the bull, you'll see that its intestines are hanging out from its guts. So uh, that this is uh, an animal that's being hunted. Is this an animal that is being consumed? Or is this an animal that's going to be sacrificed in a ritual, perhaps a fertility ritual? We don't know. You'll also notice that there is a staff with a bird carved on top of it um, next to this person. So are we looking at maybe some sort of shaman? A shaman is a kind of a spiritual leader or practitioner. Are we looking at some sort of shaman or priest figure um, who is performing maybe a kind of fertility ritual? Perhaps. Um, once again, we don't know. But what we do know is that these were really important. Otherwise, human beings would not have gone to the trouble of doing this. You know, once again, we're looking at rather large scale. This is a three foot image of a bison. Um, so images of power, images of fertility, images that emphasize the, you know, the male fertility. The image on the right is from Chauvet. Um, this is a perfect example of what I was talking about, of how some of the images overlap. In, in, in Chauvet Cave, um, you see this a lot. You see, um, you know, it's easy for us to look at this and say, oh, we're looking at maybe a herd of, of horses, but we're not. Uh, we're looking at animals that were created over tens of thousands of years apart from each other um, for whatever purpose. You know, there's, there's the idea that maybe the actual drawing of these of these animals in itself was a part of the ceremony. You know, by creating an image, you can control it. There's a belief that if these are um, images of animals that were hunted, maybe this was, uh, these, uh, these images were created to control those animals, to ensure that those animals were around or to ensure that you were victorious in your hunt. Um, there was this idea that in, in some ancient cultures that if you create an image of something, you can control that thing. So for whatever reason, hunting purposes, fertility purposes, um, maybe there's an idea here that these were under control. I wanna talk about um, two important concepts uh, in the way art um, represents a real life thing, in this case, an animal. So we're dealing with, if you notice on the image on the left, this is from Chauvet. And Chauvet's very old. Those are 30, around 30,000 BCE when those were created. The image on the right is Lascaux, and this is one of the later caves. And you'll notice though that the image on the left is more realistic looking. The older image is more realistic. Because if you look at the horns in profile, you'll notice that they're much more realistic, that they're shown overlapping. 
um, which is what horns do when you look at them from the side. This is what we call a perceptual image, meaning that the artist was recreating how we actually perceive the world. The image on the right, though, which is much later, tens, you know, it's 15,000 years later or so, the horns are actually shown this way. The horns are shown as if you're looking at them from the front, but the head is still in profile. Does this look weird? Um, <laughs> so what is going on? Well, this is called a conceptual image. And conceptual doesn't mean how we see something, but it means how we think of something. And so, for example, when you think of horns, you probably don't think of horns like this, do you? You think of horns looking like that, or like that. Ah, right? <laughs> Sorry, I had to do the metal scream. You think of horns looking like that. Not like that, that's Spider-Man. Like this. And yet, when you think of an animal, we often think of an animal in profile, or a person in profile, because that's the easiest way to conceive of their appearance. So, oftentimes in ancient art, we see um, these conceptual images where we see um, one part of the body shown from one recognizable angle, and the other part of the body, like the profile, shown from the other. Craziness, huh? But I think it's fascinating that the older image was much more realistic in its depiction, and the later image was much more conceptual and abstract. It's like human beings became less realistic as we developed our artistic skills. All right, so that's where we're going to stop here in the Paleolithic. And then next we're going to jump into the Neolithic. See you next time, guys.